afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our panel on the next generation bomber force. One of the fundamental credos of the Air Force is to be able to strike any target, anywhere, anytime. No other mission speaks to this as much as long range penetrating strike. However, this is also one of the most challenging missions to accomplish in highly contested operational environments, particularly during a peer conflict. That's why it takes stealth bombers equipped with advanced sensors and the right mix of munitions to hold our adversaries' most important assets at risk. Northrop Grumman is continuing to develop and test the next generation penetrating bomber, the B-21, as the premier capability in our nation's future long-range strike family of systems. Today, we're gonna to discuss the B-21 and the need to rapidly acquire a, the appropriate sized B-21 force that's sized to meet and defeat peer aggression, as well as meeting the national defense strategy's other operational requirements. So with that, let me introduce our panelists. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Major General Jason Armagost, Rapid Capability Office Acting Director Melissa Johnson, President of Northrop Grumman Aeronautic Systems Tom Jones, and Mitchell Institute's own retired Colonel Mark Gunzinger. Now, General Armagost is a Director of Strategic Plans, Programs, and Requirements for Global Strike Command. He's responsible for funding and requirements for modernizing the Air Force's nuclear deterrent forces including both the Sentinel ICBM, the B-21, and other systems with a budget of over $13.5 billion. He's logged over 2,900 flight hours, including time in all three bomber types in the current inventory. As the RCO's Deputy Director, Melissa Johnson helps lead the Air Force's high-speed acquisition efforts. The RCO was given responsibility for the B-21 program to take advantage of the RCO's efficient and streamlined process. Before joining the RCO, Ms. Johnson served in a variety of roles on active duty from aerodynamic propulsion analyst to material leader for several highly classified programs. And Tom Jones is a Northrop Grumman Corporate Vice President and President of Northrop Grumman Aeronautic Systems with almost 30 years experience in the aerospace and defense industries. Northrop's aeronautic system sector is the prime contractor for the B-21 project. So far, the B-21s progressed well into EMD, with six aircraft in various stages of test and final assembly, making it one of the Air Force's premier acquisition success stories. And you all heard Assistant Secretary Hunter release the news today that it will be unveiled the first week in December. Colonel retired Mark Gunzinger is Director of Future Concepts and Capability Assessments at the Mitchell Institute. And Gonzo's got over 3,000 hours in the B-52. He served almost 20 years on the Air Staff, National Security Council staff, and in OSD as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. So thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. And what I'd like to do is offer each of our distinguished panelists the opportunity to make a few opening comments so we're going to start with uh, General Armagas. So over to you, Armo. All right. Thanks, General Leptula. So I, I do want to start with thanks, actually, because you've kind of been an icon as I've come up through my time in the Air Force. Uh, it's a pleasure to share the stage with you. But I also want to thank Gonzo and what you both are doing with the thought leadership through the Mitchell Institute. It has been a uh, great help to me. Um, about how we think about the things we're going to try and tackle together and how the environment is changing and how we adapt to that changing environment. So I know I'm going to steal thunder here, but getting to go first, I get to do that. Uh, being part of this team between industry, acquisition, and the requirements owner, Warfighter, um, is really, really powerful. I think uh, uh, when RCO was stood up, it really uh, set the stage for some really, uh, really powerful, transparently, uh, uh, requirements-driven interactions that uh, don't just sustain themselves, they sustain themselves through, through relationships. So uh, I would argue that the success uh, that we've seen as we march towards uh, getting the B-21 out there uh, is, a, is a result of that. Um, and then I would offer for my initial comments, um, when I first got in the A-58 job, 
uh, last August, almost immediately, uh, I got assigned to be an ops lead for uh, one of the Secretary's operational imperatives between uh, B-21 Family of Systems. And all that did was really energize uh, this relationship, uh, not to say that it wasn't before, but it really did energize it. And it has helped me as a MAGCOM plans uh, guy in support of General Cotton to really think differently about the gaps and seams. And it's actually helped us to work on that transition piece for our legacy bombers and our weapons portfolio to really make uh, the near turn different, burn down risk, and, and, and kind of change the environment really quickly. So that's what I would offer for my intro. Very good. Ms. Johnson? Uh, good morning, or good afternoon. Uh, General Dubtilla, thank you so much for the generous invitation um, to participate um, with my esteemed colleagues here. And I'm just really proud to represent the men and women of the B-21 program office, and I know some of them are sitting in here today and all the, the DAP RCO. And I think, you know, I'm, you're, you'll probably hear some themes. I think uh, General Amargas kind of, kind of hit on that. But if I could look back before we talk specifically about B-21, I think there's really an important linkage to make between the DAF RCO and why the B-21. And for me, as I go back 19 and a half years, really as, you know, as a plank holder in the organization, it really boils down to three things, and it's really our core values. It's talent, trust, and teamwork. And so when we look at the talent that comes into the organization, and it's really a highly skilled, multifunctional workforce, you know, if you heard um, some of the other panels, especially Mr. Hunter and General Richardson today, they talked a little bit about the workforce. We, over the past 19 and a half years, have had a very um, highly skilled, not just program managers and engineers, but it really is embedding the operational community with the program office. And that is really a key component to being able to get the right weapon system out the door. Um, the second thing is, you know, the trust. You have to have the trust not only from, you know, within the organization and with your partners, but it's the trust not only from, from the leadership, meaning all the way up to the Secretary of the Air Force, but really congressional support. That trust and transparency that we have with them um, has really enabled the stability of funding for this program through the course of its um, inception. Then the third thing is really the teamwork. And I want to unpack that just for a second a little bit more, you know, than, um, than Armo did. And that teamwork really manifests itself in a couple of different areas. First and foremost, it's our acquisition um, teammates. So the B-21 program office, you know, it's in the RCO, but we could not do this without our Air Force Lifecycle Management um, Center teammates up at wright Pat. In fact, I'd say the majority of the team is at wright Patterson Air Force Base. We have a smaller contingent here in the D.C. area. And what LCMC offers is really a large scale of workforce to recruit from every area of the acquisition system. That's from program managers, financial managers, engineers, uh, contracting. And really, you, you cannot underestimate the need for really great functional support in that contracting and, and financial management. The second one that doesn't get talked about a lot but really needs to be emphasized is our partnership with the Sustainment Center. You know, we all get really fixated on developing whatever weapon system and being able to deliver that. But if you don't bake in the sustainment and the depot planning and how you can have not only sustained operations but also a life cycle affordability what you do, you know, everything else on the front end will, will start to devolve. So building that really strong foundation with the sustainment center is really bearing a lot of fruit for the long term for global strike. The third piece in, you know, is our operational um, support and that relationship with the warfighter. That is really key and quite frankly is a core value um, of the RCO from the very beginning days to the point where Global Strike personnel actually live within the program office, which is really great. So, so our program director, Colonel Spalding, has a counterpart at the 06 level, and they go everywhere together. In fact, it's to the point where they're almost probably finishing each other's sentences, and that is how tightly knit Global Strike and the organization really are, and, and we value that relationship. And then finally, and, and just as important, it's that trust and teamwork with industry. You know, the model that the RCO uses and has used over the past almost 20 years is really making that a partnership. It is not just a throwing contract actions over the wall between an industry partner and a program office. We know that we each have our roles and we know that there are certain, you know, limitations of how closely we can work, but quite frankly, you know, our teams spend so much time at, at the industry plant that sometimes it is hard to tell 
who is government and who is industry. Again, everybody is synchronized and it is the constant transparency and communications, which if you don't have that trust built between the teams, there's, it really gets tough to mitigate risk. And we know in, in a complex weapon system like this, um, there's going to be risks, there's going to be challenges, and that teamwork with Northrop Grumman and Tom specifically and his team really has enabled all of us to be able to get those challenges head on and be able to keep this on cost and schedule with the right capability um, to be able to, to deliver to global strike. And so I'm, I'm just very thankful to be a part of this team. Um, we are going to do, you know, we, we have that great teamship and then quite frankly, again, it's the congressional support that we get. And all of those things coupled together, again, bring back that talent, trust, and teamwork, which is going to give us the, the best bomber that we can get. That's a great segue to our industry partner, Tom. Okay, thank you very much, General Deptool. I'd like to thank uh, the Mitchell Institute and AFA for allowing me to participate in this panel. Uh, great honor to be on stage with my, uh, my teammates here and very proud on this special day to uh, be able to represent the B-21 industry team. Um, the last several years have been a challenge uh, for all of us uh, with uh, the, the pandemic and, and other things, stressing normal working conditions, supply chain, things like that. And th this team that we have of um, really 400 key suppliers over 40 states across the United States, the Northrop Grumman workforce, our partners, the work they've done to keep this program progressing along uh, on budget, on schedule is, is phenomenal. So again, very, very proud to represent uh, that team today. Um, the, um, you know, there's been a lot of, of positive talk about this program. Uh, General Deptula, you even, uh, uh, made some uh, nice comments at the beginning. But, you know, to Moja's point, this is a aircraft development program. It has not gone without uh, its various problems like any program would. What is different, uh, and I can say that uh, as was pointed out in the bios, as someone with over 30 years of experience in industry now, is the way the industry government team has approached those problems uh, has been very, very unique and it, again, a great thing to be a part of. So very excited to have a chance to kind of crack the door open and talk a little bit about some of the things we've done to keep this program rolling along as it should. One final point I wanted to uh, make. Uh, last year there was a rendering released of the B-21 which generated a lot of interest. Uh, although probably to a casual observer uh, that, that is not into windscreen design, um, they probably looked at it and said, that looks like the B-2. Um, and Obviously, flying wings are a great place to uh, start airplane designs to operate in a highly contested environment. What, what I think the, the real key and the magic, once we get past you know, survivability, which we actually will not talk about, um, but uh, it is the, the, the brains and the architecture inside the B-21, the open architecture system, which is going to take this you know, very capable aircraft to make sure it stays on the cutting edge of technology for decades by being able to be modernized very quickly and easily. And that hopefully is also something we can talk a little bit about today. So uh, those are my comments. Again, thank you very much. Looking forward to being on the panel. You bet, Gonzo. Yeah, so I'm really honored to be sitting on the stage with three individuals who are working every day to make the B-21 a reality for our Air Force and for our country. That's, that's pretty cool. Thank you very much. So I've been an advocate of a new penetrating bomber since uh, the 1990s. I was in every study you can imagine in the Department of Defense uh, that took a look at what we really need in the way of long-range strike capabilities. The bottom-up review of 1993, I'm dating myself, the 1997 Deep Attack Weapons Mix study, all the way up to the Tiger Team effort that culminated with the decision to proceed with the LRSB, now the B-21. And here's some of the key insights from all those studies. Only penetrating bombers can deny an adversary like China or Russia or others sanctuary deep in their interiors. Only a combination of stealth, wideband, all aspects stealth will give us the kind of survivability we need to operate in highly contested environments that are going to exist throughout a conflict with China. 
the range the B-21 and other bombers bring to the fight will allow us to respond within hours of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan or adventure in the South China Sea to be, go on the offensive and, be, and to strike their high value targets and show them that we are determined and we are not going to allow this aggression to stand. Only bombers can bring the payload capacity that's needed to strike thousands of targets in hundreds of hours in those kinds of uh, uh, invasion scenarios, including uh, an invasion of uh, Taiwan. A second insight is the size of the force. The size of the bomber force is way too small today. Come to the uh, uh, panel this afternoon, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. We need a penetrating bomber force of at least 200 aircraft. We have to have the capacity to continue to go on the offensive and strike Chinese targets, Russian targets, to halt their fait accompli uh, aggression deny and then and defeat that uh, aggression. And finally, we still hear occasionally words of, well, why don't we just rely more on standoff weapons and avoid the cost of a, a penetrating bomber? Study after study after study has shown that that is not a more cost-effective way of delivering large numbers of bombs on aim points. In a conflict with China, we might have to strike 80 to 100,000 aim points, and the cost of those standoff weapons alone make it prohibitive. That's why we need a penetrating bomber. They can use lower cost weapons at scale to, uh, to defeat uh, our adversaries. With that, General Datua, back to you. Okay, well, thank you all for those uh, insightful opening remarks. What I'd like to do is uh, dig into the subject in a little bit more detail. Um, so, Armo, first question for you. Um, as a director of strategic plans, programs, and requirements for a Global Strike Command, what's the demand signal that's coming from the COCOMs for a future penetrating uh, strike force? And how about that future force size, given our national defense strategy and all the requirements that it entails? So, I think I've seen a patch from every MAGCOM uh, here at AFA, and it won't be a surprise to any of you from within your own perspectives, but the demand across the COCOMs, whether they're regional or uh, global, is ubiquitous and unending, and, and to Gonzo's point, beyond the capacity we currently have. And so, uh, and it, that actually does kind of touch back to my point about the operational imperatives and how we're thinking diff differently about this, because, you know, the B-21 is not operationally fielded yet, right? So we've had to figure out how, how we're going to do this in transition and, and with legacy platforms and how can we bring burn down risk for the B-21 but simultaneously increase our capacity and our ability to get into that denied airspace and turn it into a contested airspace so that we can compete and deter, actually. Uh, and a lot of really interesting thinking, again, is coming out of that. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're quite often now doing on Bomber Task Force, we're going... Uh, COCOM to COCOM, right, on the same mission. And the integration that happens along the way with our partners and allies is not just a signal. It's, it's a real thing to uh, show that we are not limited by lines on a map, and, and, it, and it gets us, again, thinking differently about the, uh, uh, the capacity problem and the timing and tempo problem for how we would do this uh, at scale. Very good. Well, here's a bit of a follow-on for uh, both Tom and uh, Gonzo. B-21 is envisioned as a dual-capable, conventional, as well as nuclear mission long-range bomber that's aimed to replace the B-2. So how does the B-21 stack up to the global operational demands that Armo just laid out? Yeah, uh, you want to go first? Okay. B-21 is America's China deterrence bomber, no question about it. The combination of payload range survivability will allow us to respond to a short notice uh, scenario where China invades Taiwan, or pick another scenario, uh, to, to begin to thwart their campaign plan, to defeat uh, their campaign. You mentioned dual capability. There's something else going on here, and that is China is building up its nuclear warhead inventory. Now, uh, Admiral Charles Richards said that, uh, uh, frankly, we're in a China is in a strategic breakout with regard to their nuclear weapons. Uh, 
General Cotton made the point uh, uh, during his confirmation hearing that, uh, uh, frankly, China is quite obvious that they're not building a minimal nuclear deterrent. They have a triad, as does Russia. We need to rethink our nuclear posture. Do we have the right posture today now that we're facing two peers or maybe near peers, peers in the future when it comes to nuclear weapons? How are we going to deter both of them? We might have to grow our nuclear forces. What's the most cost-effective way of doing that? Build more Columbia-class submarines, which are horrendously expensive? Dig more holes in the ground for ICBM? And I, I love the GBSD, I'm not saying that, but B-21s would it allow us to hedge against risk in the future, grow our nuclear deterrence if necessary, plus they're dual capable. We get the benefit of their conventional capabilities as well. Okay, this question so, uh, is for Ms. Johnson to start, and then each of you. I was going to have oh, some sorry. thoughts on that. If that's and right. I actually want to pile on. <laughs> Didn't mean to cut you off, Tom. <laughs> Fair enough. So, uh, you know, for, first of all, Global Strike Command was very clear on the requirements. They're looking for this platform in that transition that you mentioned, uh, General. And, uh, you know, working together with Global Strike Command and RCO, I think we made the platform that, that answers those questions. Uh, you know, Gonzo, you're far better at, at talking about nuclear force structure than I am. I'm just a, a nerd engineer. So I, I'll focus in a little bit more on some of the aspects we've attempted to address as we've developed the B-21 that we think is going to give the capability that Global Strike Command has asked for us, focusing mainly on maintainability, survivability, and data. So from a maintainability standpoint, it's been very important to us right from the inception of this program to design a system, a weapon system, that is capable of operating as a daily flyer. So we've had a real focus on maintenance right from the start. Uh, we actually today and for over a year now, I believe, have had members of Global Strike Command maintainers with us in our facilities, working side by side in the labs. We also have something we've talked about in the past called a highly uh, immersive virtual environment, which you can basically go into a virtual reality space, work on maintaining the system, understand what things in the design need to change before you ever started, uh, I'll use the phrase bending metal, although we don't bend too much metal on the program, but, um, you know, and are able to address those maintainability uh, types of aspects there. So I, I think that's a big step. Now, I said I wasn't going to talk about survivability, and I said I'm going to talk about survivability. Well, obviously, a great platform for operating in a highly contested environment. But specifically, what I want to talk about is, you know, we took lessons learned from the B2 and other programs about the difficulty, once again, in maintaining uh, you know, stealth types of platforms actually went out and looked at the major drivers on the B2 and right from the start had designs that addressed those to make sure that we could once again live up to that ambition of being the daily flyer. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about data. Um, yesterday we uh, made an announcement at a media event that earlier on this summer uh, we entered into an agreement with the government where we're actually sharing program data in a common data environment, which I think for a program of this scope and at this phase of the program, uh, at least from our experience, it's kind of unprecedented to have that type of shared access between our government partners and ourselves. And what that does is, once again, enables us to spot risks, to address risk, to burn them down, uh, make sure we've got the right approach to verifying requirements and get the system operational as soon as we can. We also talked about the fact that we were able to uh, move the B-21 ground support system up to the cloud, which again we think is a, another great movement for the digital enterprise and for digital transformation, because what that's going to do is drastically reduce the footprint at main operating bases and other uh, deployment locations, as well as driving down costs. So. Lots of different things we've taken, uh, not just looking at it from a pure technical performance, but how can we make sure that for the men and women of Global Strike Command, we're providing a platform that's going to give them the operational utility that they need. And I will hey, hop in there. <laughs> so uh, back to Gonzo's point about uh, you know breakout in China, as Admiral Richard clearly spoke about, um, with triads, and you have two adversaries with 
uh, real capabilities um, now. There is not a lot of, you know, history, history points us to some interesting studies on deterrence, but not a lot of the thinking right now has, has gotten us very far down the field on multipolar deterrence, right, having to deter two adversaries at the same time. But one of the things that you'll find is a common discussion point of, that we have to be able to do to be able to do multipolar deterrence is to be able to integrate that conventional and nuclear force activity such that uh, there is no escalation for free. Uh, there is no escalate to win. There is no escalate to de-escalate. And by having that baked in conventional nuclear integration, um, we literally are kind of taking that off the table, right? And so we have to do that so that we can, we can further through the thought leadership uh, uh, of, of those in the room, but also the think tanks and, and our, our policy makers, how we get to that multipolar deterrence future. Knowing right now we've got to be able to do uh, things in a very uh, predictable way in denied spaces. And yeah, that's a panel subject all on its own, and hopefully the folks recrafting the national defense strategy are taking that into consideration. Um, as I already previewed earlier, Ms. Johnson, this one's for you to start, but I'd like everyone to chime in. Um, speed. Uh, by which I mean the rapidly maturing and fielding of a B-21 force is obviously critical. Uh, the B-21 is going to soon reach its rollout, as we heard this morning, and uh, first flight milestones. So what's the RCO doing to ensure the program continues to remain on track and on time? Um, and um, should we be discussing today the need to increase the acquisition rate of B-21s? Okay. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack right there. So, so let's kind of go back a little bit of, in my opening remarks, I talked about a couple of the philosophies. So how do you go fast? A lot of the going fast is really getting that initial decision to go. Well, we've got that. So we got on contract, we have a very stable requirement, and we have consistent funding. And those three things, right, it's not magic. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple recipe, but making sure that that can stay stable through the years does get more challenging as the years go on. And I think that the team overall, and it is only because of the partnership that we are able to be successful at that. So I think that's, the, that's, that's a key thing, and that's for any program, but I think B21 is a great exemplar of that. The second thing, you know, internally within the RCO, you know, we've coined a term, but it's really been done over the past 19 and a half years, and we, we coined the term active management. And really what that means is you know, my team, along with Tom's team, along with Armo's team, are so close-knit together. So again, it's all kind of coming together as this, um, this partnership, but they are not just waiting for, we are not just waiting for Tom's team to send us information, and then we are not just spending some time back in our own little enclave and then sending information back over to Tom or direction back over to, to Northrop. It is a daily interaction, and that actively managing and really getting ahead of where are those risks going to start to manifest, and how do we come up with the plans, not only just identify that, that a risk could manifest, but what is the plans to mitigate that and really get, get at that early. And there's a couple of things that the, the program really did in the very early days, and I, I mentioned the sustainment piece kind of really laying in the foundation for how do we depot maintenance and sustain this for the long term. But even on the development piece, there's some really key things we did um, with the company. And you know, one of them is how do we go and build in the tooling and the processes so that you're actually building the production asset. So a lot of programs will build a lot of test assets or a couple of test assets first. You'll test it out. You'll see what goes right and what goes wrong. And then you'll make adjustments in the tooling to go build your production. That takes a lot of extra resources and time, and so we've been able to kind of shrink down that time by starting right from the get-go, and it's really been enabled by the digital engineering tools that the Northrop team has, has embedded into that process from day one. And so when you kind of start building these things up upon each other, you really start to consolidate and get the most efficiency you can knowing that there's still systems engineering that has to go on. You mean we cannot break the laws of, of physics, and there's still going to be challenges, but you want to get yourself to the point where that team has enough information, that we have stable requirements, and that we have the tool sets between the production processes, the engineering digital 
the digital engineering that you are enabled to go and solve any technical challenge that we can come upon. And so that allows us to stay on schedule and really kind of look for areas to, to, uh, to scale or to go faster. Now, if I kind of go a step further and start talking a little bit about, you know, do we want to, you know, how do we go faster in the future? Can we increase that, that scale or increase that rate? You know, when we look at the provisions that we've put into the program, I think we can always look at that, but you want to kind of get this on a solid foundation. And once, you know, production aircraft start coming off the line, the team's going to learn some things, but because, again, of the foundation that we built, we can roll back those lessons learned into the system very quickly. And through the open mission systems, being able to modify things, if there is a requirements change, if there's a new threat that comes along, if there's modernization, that we can continue to be able to move at a very rapid pace compared to the way that we've done things years ago. Nice job. Gonzo? Yeah, really quickly. Uh, we've heard into a PACOM and the uh, DNI talk about uh, China might be ready to make a move on Taiwan at 2027-2030 time frame. That's going to occur at the same time we're at a nadir in the size of our bomber force. If we allow the bomber ramp, B-21 acquisition ramp, to be reduced because that's where the money is, we've all seen that happen program after program because once the acquisition begins, and that becomes a very lucrative target. It's just slide some money out and put it towards other capability. Uh, that is going to hurt our ability to deter or respond to Chinese aggression. I call the B-21 the China deterrence bomber. It's not going to deter if it's not on the ramp. We need to maximize our acquisition ramp and continue to flow the dollars toward that program and not allow the green eye shade folks to just cut a little bit here and there for other program. Armin or Tom, care to comment? I, I think Ms. Johnson did an excellent job covering most of the points I was okay. going to hit. I'd just foot stomp one or two things here. You know, the, the, uh, the collaboration and the active contract management, I, I think, is a, um, a key feature. And one of those things, when I said it's something unlike anything I've seen in my time in the industry that is only going to improve with this digital environment that we're bringing on the ability to share digital data back and forth. So I think that that's a, that's a very important element. And uh, the other point that I think is really important is that building a first article that is production representative. And frankly, I think that is a, a best practice we need to look at trying to perpetuate as we go and build other aircraft. Um, you know, there is a lot of time that can be lost in putting together prototypes that are, at the end of the day, not very representative of the final thing that you need to build. And, um, you know, bar barring, you know, super sophisticated design, usually most of the problems you run into these programs are the basic manufacturability and the processes that you have to have to go into production. So I think that is a, a, a great path that, uh, you know, the RCO has enabled us to take on this program, and again, the best practice we should really consider on future aircraft programs. Very good. Here's one on transitioning the force. Um, the Air Force currently plans to have the B-21 replace the B-2, but as we all know, the Air Force is in desperate need for long-range strike capacity given accelerating advanced threats. During the transition period from the B-2 to the B-21, what are some of the risks that you see in the long-range strike mission area? And do you have any recommendations on minimizing this risk by retra retaining B-2s longer or building more B-21 sooner? I'll take that one. Uh, so, you know, we, as, as a MAGCOM, a force provider, we have to constantly uh, assess what the future, what's changing under our feet and how we, how we ad address that. But I will say this, one of the things that allows us to understand that environment uh, in ways maybe that uh, we might not have in the past is our connectedness, not just to this team here, but across MAGCOMs, you know, AMC. We have, there are dependencies from every MAGCOM into other MAGCOMs that if you don't pay attention to them can bite you very hard. And so, so that transition piece uh, as we get to B-21 is really driving us into understanding, you know, what are, what are the expectations that PACAF has for us uh, as far as tempo and, and number of targets, like Gonzo points out, 
But, you know, there are dependencies backwards through AMC, uh, and we've built some interesting relationships and partnerships there. Uh, you know, as you look at how the conduct of a China fight would go down, um, you know, there's an inside force piece to that where AFSOC uh, is very interested in, in, in connecting and, and understanding their environment in new ways, which is beneficial to us. So that system connectedness uh, really is important to understand that and characterize it and move forward together so that we don't build ourselves handmade wooden shoes that uh, don't talk to other handmade wooden shoes. Um, if I could add something on there also, just as the, sure. uh, the prime on the B2 as well. You know, obviously the decision of what happens with the B2 is Global Strike uh, Command decision and, and we're going to support that. Uh, that said, you know, we are continuing to work on modernization of that platform. Uh, recently, I think you probably saw the integration and test of a JASM ER. Uh, we've also brought in a radar assisted targeting system uh, that is going to provide improved targeting. And probably one of the things I'm most excited about, we talked about the open architecture in the B21, but we've been able to do a uh, open, uh, mission, open mission system architecture that's decoupling a lot of the mission systems avionics from the flight control, which means we have a platform that can be easily upgraded without affecting flight worthiness. So um, if that desire is there to extend, we have a platform we think we can scale forward. If you're in a hole, don't dig it deeper. Uh, I'm a advocate of maintaining B-2 in the force at least until the B-21 reaches the IOC, not doing it for one, one swaps as soon as an operational B-21 uh, uh, hits the ramp. We already have a bomber force that's too small. We already have a penetrating bomber force that really is a silver bullet force. We need to build up that capacity, especially in the late 2030s, again, to deter China, be prepared to respond instead of making a resource-driven decision to retire B-2s as uh, uh, B-21s come on. Let's keep them in the force until the 2030s, reduce that risk, and then gracefully uh, retire them. Okay, we're coming in uh, the final stretch here, so please, uh, I'd like to give you each an opportunity to answer this last, last one. Um, and this is about advanced weapons. You know, our leaders, Air Force leaders, and all of us recognize we need advanced uh, weapons for our advanced aircraft. Um, and we've also heard people talk about the need for affordable mass. So could each of you give us your quick thoughts in terms of what kinds of weapons uh, that would help maximize the warfighting potential of the B-21? So I would, I, the only thing I would add to that question actually is uh, we need the right advanced weapons mix, right? Because a lot of times if you get to the, um, what do you call them, the green eye shade folks, right? I, I won't say that, but I think that's what you call them. Um, they, they might tell you, hey, you need X thousand of this, right? That answers your question. I will tell you categorically it does not answer your question. You need the right advanced weapons mix, um, and preferably that's a, you know, that's a joint problem, right? We can, we can capitalize on money that is being spent in the Department of Defense, not just in the Air Force. Um, and there are capabilities that where you have to compress time very quickly to make an effect uh, very quickly, and then there are times you need mass and tempo. Uh, and, and if you sequence and build that portfolio properly, then you can, it opens up new possibilities to do things uh, that may not require as many weapons and is a cost eff efficient answer to, to that question. Yeah, I think, you know, to tag on a little bit to what Armo and even before what Tom was talking about with open mission systems, I think, you know, what, what on the acquisition side, we are really kind of the enabler to whatever that requirement turns out to be. And, and having as much flexibility and giving the, the MAGCOM, giving Global Strike as many options as they can. But that open mission systems and really, again, it's all about how you build that foundation. If you don't build that in up front, you know, you can always do it later. We've shown that through many programs, but it does become, a, it takes a lot longer and becomes much more cost prohibitive. So I think what we've done, and then obviously, you know, the operational imperatives are really driving some of this right now. We're already looking at what type of advanced capabilities. Um, even a year ago, we, we laid out a modernization plan that, that Chief Brown signed off on that was a combined effort between us and Global Strike and really kind of been able to kind of, again, lay that foundation for when that time comes and the resources are there, we are ready to take action right away instead of, you know, to Gonzo's point, you don't have to study it for the next, 
you know, five to seven years. Again, that's really, you know, where a lot of time gets expended. If we've done all that work up front, then it's just an execution issue. Okay, go ahead, Tom, real quick. Uh, yeah, well, I couldn't have said it better. We're here to impl implement requirements, and I think Ms. Johnson hit the nail on the head. Okay, I'll just say, do we have sufficient weapons in the inventory to deal with a 100,000 aim point campaign? Just, uh, that's, a, that's a good final parting thought to think about. Um, we've come to the end of our panel. Really appreciate all our panelists for being here today, and we thank all of you in the, for what you do to defend our, uh, our nation. So for all of you in the audience, um, thanks for uh, being here. The next discussion here in Potomac Sea will be cyber technology. And with that, have a great aerospace power kind of day.